everyone and welcome back i once again i'm brett norton with beyond clean and i like to sincerely give a shout out one more time to ask first case and power supply for collaborating on today's event one thing i also wanted to remind everybody because i did see some comments in the last session about difficulties with sound and video if you are having those issues on your side, please go ahead and refresh your browser. That should fix that problem. About 99.9% .9 of the time, it's, it clears up the issue. Oftentimes when we're on a podcast or a broadcast for a long time, if your, your browser tends to get a little bit tired. So just do that and you should be in good shape. Speaker today, again, is my colleague, Bobby Parker. Bobby is the VP of Clinical Solutions for Beyond Clean. And as I said in the last session, he's incredibly passionate about sterile processing education, providing on-site consulting, and creating digital education content for sterile processing professionals. The title of Bobby's presentation today is Building a Culture of Quality, the Dreamwork and Teamwork of Data. As sterile processing professionals, we know good enough is never good enough. Every technician, department educator, and leader should strive to produce the safest surgical instrument possible, every instrument, every time. But doesn't it always take teamwork? During this session, we will explore the strategies you can use to promote collaboration and communication within your sterile processing team to enhance data utilization and teamwork mentality. We will also identify the steps you can take today to start building an, the, an effective culture of quality in your SPD. So let's go ahead and welcome Bobby Parker to the big stage. Hello there, thank you for joining our presentation today, uh, the Beyond Clean presentation, Building a Culture of Quality, How to Develop a Team that Bleeds Perfection. My name is Bobby Parker, I'm the VP of Clinical Solutions here at Beyond Clean, and I'm excited to be talking about this particular topic to you. It's kind of a hobby horse of mine about how we view quality in our sterile processing departments, because honestly, good enough in the world of sterile processing is never good Good enough. Our aim should be about producing the safest surgical instrument possible, every instrument, every time as we always say, and that should be the driving force behind every technician, every department educator, every leader across our industry. But that culture, that quality doesn't just happen. It's not a list of check boxes, it's not a list of processes, but that grows out of a culture of quality. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about is building a culture that becomes the seedbed, if you will, that a quality processes can grow up out of. And so settle in. Um, if Whether you're a technician or an educator or a department leader or someone who's just curious about this industry, maybe a, a vendor, I would encourage you to stay connected. I'm going to try to draw all these strings back together at the end um, for how we can all participate in building not just quality processes in our department, but establishing a culture of quality where patients come first. And by the way, after we are done, I would encourage you um, to go check out the Beyond the Tour uh, docu-series that uh, we've done. This presentation was sponsored by Asculap, and there's an episode that was done with Asculap and some of these concepts and ideas um, are well supported by that particular episode as one of the topics that kept coming up over and over again is doing the right thing of what what does quality look like so I would encourage you to check that out in today's presentation um, the, my objectives are going to be how to develop a shared vision for quality in your department. And I underline shared vision instead of having a leader who's established a vision of what's going to happen in my department and everybody else getting in line. But how do you have that be a shared vision across your department? How do you establish a culture that supports the gold standard of quality and getting into what does that standard look like? And then evaluating what changes would allow your particular people, 
processes and products to be the absolute best for patient care. So with that, let's dive in. The first thing that I want to do today is to try to help define or perhaps redefine what quality looks like in the sterile processing department. What is the gold standard of quality in sterile processing? And when I say what's the gold standard of quality in sterile processing, there's really only one gold standard. And, and perhaps this is a bit cliche and overused, but I think, it, I think it holds water. Whether or not something is good enough in sterile processing is, is it good enough for your loved ones? Is that surgical tray good enough for you? Um, who knows whether or not it'll be used on your loved ones. Maybe it will be you who's going to be getting surgery at your particular facility. And is the tray that you're cleaning in Deacon Tam cleaned appropriately such that you would be comfortable with that tray being used on you after the sterilization processes are over? Um, Quality has to go deeper than just meeting compliance standards or following the SOP. Quality is a personal commitment to patients being at the end of the line. It's not, am I, you know, assembling this tray according to this particular checklist, but is this tray appropriate for use on a person, um, a person that I love and care about? If you've worked in sterile processing very long, you probably have experienced similar stories. Um, had a former employee call and tell me that his daughter was having surgery at a facility the following week, laid out all the trays that were likely to be used and asked uh, for the team to keep an eye on the schedule for when that case is going to appear on the schedule and make sure that these particular trays are going to be the ones that are pulled for that surgery. I've seen that play out a number of different times, and I'm sure you probably have too. But when we see that happen, whenever we have a loved one that's going to be having surgery and uh, someone invested in that takes on the action of wanting to personally do their trays or personally pick which trays are going to be used on that surgery, doesn't that indicate something to us that something is not quite right. Um, shouldn't shouldn't any of our trays from our inventory be good uh, enough? Sh shouldn't we have pride and trust in any of the work that we've done as a department um, to care for that person that we care about and uh, and love them? And it also comes down to an ethical question: Why why do we value the life uh, of that one person? Why do we value their surgery over um, that same degree of care extending to other patients who come into the department? We should be able to pull any particular tray. And so that is the gold standard of quality in the sterile processing department. Is this good enough for my loved ones? And that should be what's expected of us for every tray and not just when a loved one happens to be coming through surgery. Quality is also, it's an outgrowth of values-driven work. I made allusion to this already, but quality is not something that is a list of checkboxes. We're going to talk about quality management programs and going back and checking through a list of checkboxes. Did this meet all of our expectations? But really, having quality work, building a quality department is more about who we are than what we do. Um, it is an outgrowth of what we value in the department. Sterile processing is a department that should attract the type of person who's there for the patients that they're serving and not particularly, you know, trying to make the most money that they possibly can or uh, find the easiest job that they possibly can find in order to make that money. Um, and when your values conflict with the work that's in front of you, you're not going to have quality. And so as the second shift looks around and they see a growing pile of trays and maybe some pressure from the OR to get certain ones pushed through first, at some point they may begin to value self-preservation of moving these trays through the process over valuing the, um, the safety of the patient who's in surgery. And so they begin to take some shortcuts. Do you see how those values tie to those actions? And so this presentation is less about which check boxes do you need to establish in your department and more about how do you begin to promote and establish those values that as a department, as a team, we're going to continually be placing the patient first instead of other priorities that might be competing with that. 
And that gets at the last bullet on this slide. No other measures are going to overcome a lack of commitment. We can focus on processes, on products, on people, all we want. But if those people don't have an intrinsic commitment to doing their job well for the safety of patients, it's going to be impossible for you to feel confident that your loved ones could be treated by the work that you produce. It'd be impossible to just pull a tray off the shelf because maybe this one wasn't quality checked by the quality technician. No, instead what we need is a team that collaboratively and together um, value patient care and patient safety. That is the type of quality we're talking about in today's presentation. So what are the building blocks to a culture of quality? Uh, to keep it simple, we've broken it down into our favorite three groups, the three Ps, uh, your people, your products, and your processes. So first, looking at people. And we're going to dive into this more later, but when we think about building teams that, that eat, breathe, and sleep quality, it starts with the people. Your team has got to know um, three things if they're going to be a team that that is proud of the work that they do in the department. First is, what is their role in creating a culture of quality? And this is what's missing from the team that is led by one visionary leader who's got a picture of what quality is going to look like, but the individual maybe doesn't, it's not their vision. Uh, they don't really have much of a say in it. They're just kind of there for the paycheck. And so they're going to comply with the new policies that get released, but they're not necessarily pushing forward. Um, for a mental picture, this would be one leader who's pulling far ahead and has a bunch of followers that he's kind of dragging along in the wagon behind him. And instead, what we want is a coalition, uh, a militia of, um, of people who are violent about quality uh, marching forward together alongside that leader. And so what is their particular role in creating that culture of quality? What is it that they need to do as a technician to participate in that, but also how can they go about encouraging their peers in that? And we'll get more into how, like, what that looks like as the presentation goes on. Secondly, they need to know why a culture of quality matters to the patient. And so um, as we talk about cultures of quality, it gets pretty minute at points. We're going to talk about like keeping your break room clean and why people need to be able to trace the line from the work that they're doing to the patient that's at the other end of it, even if it's as ridiculous as picking up some trash on the floor in the break room. And then thirdly, they need to know how to accomplish that shared vision of uh, quality. Uh, great teams can't work together with their hands tied behind their back um, because broken processes lead to a host, uh, a host of other issues. Um, they need to know how their daily work is going to accomplish that daily um that daily shared vision. Second category of things, uh, looking at your products. Uh, the old adage is true. Uh, you get out of a, uh, out of something what you put in. So if you expect quality products, you've got to put quality in. So, and when you think about quality products, that doesn't necessarily mean the most expensive thing, right? There is value to be found in sterile processing, and we have to be financially responsible. But does it accomplish the work that it's supposed to do consistently and safely? Um, the ancient Greeks uh, used a concept called teleology to describe whether an object met its intended purpose, its teleos, the thing that it was made for. So if you were to have Aristotle come into your department, and look at your steam sterilizers, and he saw one that looked like it was um, sterilizing instruments the way that they should be sterilized, he would say that that is a good quality machine, even though maybe it's from 1991 and it has the old kind of submarine style door on the front of it and doesn't have as many features. It consistently does its job uh, without breaking down. But if next to it, there was a sterilizer with all of the, uh, all of the newest features, but it keeps producing wet packs or breaking down, that is not a quality product. Um, that is That would be considered a bad sterilizer. And that's what I'm talking about when it comes to evaluating your instruments or the cleaning brushes or the uh, equipment that you have in your department. Do you have quality products for your technicians both to be proud of and for them to be able to do their work efficiently? 
And then lastly, with, uh, with processes, and this is kind of what I was getting at with the how for people earlier, is um, great teams can't work with their hands tied behind their back. Uh, if you have broken processes, it leads to a host of other issues. So the mental picture of traveling down a road, can you get to your destination on bad roads? Well, yeah, you probably can, but can you imagine traveling cross country, uh, but replace the interstates with gravel roads where you have to drive 20 miles an hour? Your car is going to get a little bit beat up. It's certainly going to get dirty and it's going to take you, you know, four times as long to get there. And so. Instead of, uh, instead of that, of having a great team that's committed to quality, but uh, everybody kind of disagrees on the right way of getting things done, we ought to have quality processes that are documented, that they're written, that they're uh, repeatable, that expectations are very clear, such that if a stranger were to come into your department and they only knew your stated processes in your SOPs, they could potentially succeed with a limited amount of training. That's the type of processes that we're talking about. And so these three building blocks are going to be what we continue to talk about in building this culture of quality in our department, your people, the products that you have, and your processes. So if you're going to begin this journey in your department of looking at quality, you need to look at your department with the lens of quality and ask maybe some tough questions of yourself, some honest questions. So here are some that might reveal perhaps some challenges to your team's culture. Um, the first, do you embrace or dislike certain ideas based on who they come from? This, uh, this gets at a concept called unconscious bias. Um, you think this particular idea, would I like it more if it was me who came up with the idea or if it was one of my high performers who came up with this particular idea? Um, one way that I've seen departments try to get around this is to uh, create processes for people to submit process improvement ideas that are anonymous. You know, put a put an idea box in or a suggestion box in the break room and then review it amongst leaders where it's not tied to a particular name. but Anything that you can do to try to promote the generation of ideas and valuing them based on, um, based on the merit of the idea and not the individual who suggested it. Secondly, how have your views or perspectives changed since you've been a leader from the first day in the department or until now, or even as a technician? What are those things in the department that when you came into the department, you thought that they were wrong and that perhaps one day it might change? And now that you've kind of been in these waters for a while, you've begun to think that they're acceptable. In what ways have you allowed your standards to lower as you've been working in the department? And then lastly, what does it look like when a commitment to quality begins to break down? What I want to show you would be maybe four categories of things that as you ask these questions of yourself, you might begin to see um, quality break down. And that's in the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the unknown. So the good, meaning the good enough, the bad, the ugly, and the unknown. So first, the good, or the good enough. One way you might see a breakdown of quality in your department is in the attitude that things are good. Good enough, that is. Um, these are the teams that feel that um, if infection prevention is not actively knocking at their door or their next joint commission survey is still two years out, there isn't really any need to make any improvements. The surgeons aren't complaining. Things seem to be going fairly well. Our KPIs are okay. Our department productivity is acceptable. Nobody's complaining about it at this point. We don't have a survey coming for a while. And so this is good enough. Um, what this looks like is just kind of sliding under the radar, doing enough to not get in trouble at the technician level. You know, maybe not going to try to wow anybody, but uh, definitely want to stay off of the manager's attention. So just sliding under the radar. Avoiding uh, more complicated trays. You think if I if I tackle that open heart instrument set, I might I might make a mistake, and I don't want to make a mistake, and so I'm just going to choose not to learn that and stay in the realm that I'm particularly comfortable in. 
or just sticking to the areas that you're personally familiar with, what's in my comfort zone. And the, the harsh reality about the good enough is that when we accept good enough, that sometimes means we're closing the door on greatness. When we accept good enough, we're closing the door on great. So look for this uh, attitude in your department where people settle into good enough and instead um, encourage them to be inspired to pursue uh, greatness. We want to be not just an okay sterile processing department. We want to be the best sterile processing department. Another thing you might see is the bad. Uh, the bad occurs when issues um, start to stem from a lack of training, maybe poor attention to detail, uh, broken processes. Uh, these are issues that that don't meet standards, uh, but maybe we've just decided to live with it because of workflow concerns or, or preferences from our customers or precedent. This is how they've always done it, so we're just going to live with it. So you might be hearing things like this. Yeah, it, it's a known gap. Um, issues that we know are non-compliant, but they're kept in place because they help us get our work done. Um, an example of this that uh, that might be a little bit too close to home for you is uh, tray weight. Uh, we know that trays in our inventory are supposed to be above 25 pounds, but uh, often we look the other way because how are you really supposed to get that book, Walter, set under 25 pounds anyway? Um, a culture of quality would say, we're not going to let this pass, and we're going to look at what innovations are out there to try to make sure that we can meet this standard. But um, maybe a lack of a culture of quality might say, yeah, it's wrong, but is it that big of a deal? We're just going to let it pass. Maybe you'll hear, well, that's how things have always been done here. Those are the, those are the most dangerous words in healthcare. This is how we've always done it. And uh, the response to that is past practice. It doesn't always uh, mean that the thing is right. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, that was the best way to do things. But best practices change over time. Technologies evolve over time. Uh, instruments evolve in complexity over time. So what may be acceptable 10, 12, 15 years ago might not be acceptable today. And so um, really that resistance to change that says, I'm going to continue doing things the way we've always done it is an indication that there's not a culture of quality in the department that strives to be the best, that strives to achieve that golden standard of every tray, every instrument, every time being safe for any patient and not just my personal loved ones. We can see this lack of quality stem from allowing our uh, users, um, our our OR customers to have too much leeway in sterile processing as well. Uh, I think about maybe that one heart surgeon who might prefer that their suctions come sterilized, assembled, and already together. Um, but quality and sterile processing ultimately follows that manufacturer's IFU. And so you maybe encounter a situation that's kind of a sacred cow nowadays, like, oh, we can't touch Dr. Smith's suctions because they've always been sterilized that way and he expects them to come that way. That might be an indication of a lack of a culture, qual culture of quality in the department because instead a, a a quality sterile processing department is going to say, well, we're going to stand up for patient safety and what's right. And we're going to talk through with Dr. Smith the science of why this is important and persuade him that we need to keep our patients safe and do not only what's right and legal, but also what is safe for our patients. You might be hearing, ah, we've got bigger fish to fry. Um, just because quality is lacking to a greater degree in one area doesn't mean that quality is sufficient across the system as a whole. And so it's easy uh, to let bad quality go whenever there are bigger fish to fry, worse issues around the corner. But a quality department isn't going to just rely upon that one leader to slowly make changes on one thing at a time and only address the big issues, but technicians will take it upon themselves to ensure that we're uh, having quality products in all areas of our department and not just that one kind of hot topic right now that needs to be addressed right away. So you might see the bad where people have decided to live with it. 
you might see some of the ugly. Um, the ugly is a quality that results ultimately in the worst outcomes uh, called sentinel events. Uh, a sentinel event is an unanticipated event in a healthcare setting that results in death or serious physical or psychological injury to a patient not related to the natural course of that patient's illness. These are prevented, uh, preventable errors that unfortunately impacted a patient's health. And I don't know, the harsh reality of working in sterile processing is that at the far end of quality, of the quality spectrum, it isn't like a hair in someone's cheeseburger. Uh, it isn't the disappointment of a customer. The end of that spectrum is harm or sometimes even death of a patient. And so building a team that craves quality means making sure that they understand how serious our work is. Um, it makes me think of this uh, story of a supervisor that was often found picking up bits of trash or the random indicator that had fallen on the floor. And when they were asked why it mattered, they responded that um, on one end of the sterile processing spectrum is that department where everything is clean and orderly, all the trays are perfectly lined up and sterile. At the other end of the spectrum is the type of department where trays uh, went up dirty to the OR, everything's a mess in the department, and uh, his opinion was having dirty floors uh, made them closer to the chaotic version of that department uh, than the perfect one, and it was just a small way to ensure that a value of quality was demonstrated in daily work. Um, and this goes back to the idea of you know cleaning up our break room, like is having crumbs on the table in your break room and scuffs on the floor and trash that's flowing out of the trash bins and a refrigerator that's jam-packed full of uh, Susie's half-eaten sandwiches for the last two weeks, is that ultimately going to impact a patient? And as you try to draw that direct line, you might say no. But the reality is um, culture, it's not, uh, quality is not just a list of check boxes of you know, what we're checking on the instruments along the way. It bubbles up out of a culture of quality. And so a department that has a culture of quality, the department, the sterile processing department that's known for, uh, for cleaning instruments and providing sterile products, they ought to be the one department that cares so much about their working environment that they keep things clean and disinfected. If you will. And so seeing that department, uh, that break room being cared for poorly, it really demonstrates how that's bubbled up out of just a lack of care for how we're going to do our work with excellence and a department that emphasizes quality at the team level and has developed a shared vision for owning an excellent process, their break room is going to be spotless. And that's just... Um, that's just kind of the way the, the way the results work out for those two things. And so that particular supervisor not wanting to see the quality spectrum shift all the way to the ugly was just trying to show through, you know, one outward action how we're going to take quality seriously in our department. I like that story. The fourth would be the unknown. Um, these are the things that are wrong in your department, but you don't know it yet. Um, this fourth quality uh, breakdown is something that we have to keep our eyes out on, uh, out for, and they're errors that we aren't aware due to lack of education, lack of oversight and accountability. Um, so questions like, are your machines being maintained properly? Are your inspection points being done consistently? Maybe you have policies, but maybe they're not being followed through. Uh, are your staff being trained properly? Maybe you have a training program, but, um, but you find that it's not being checked off appropriately. Um, and so, unfortunately, these unknown things, they're things that we tend not to find out proactively. Uh, they're things we find out during a survey or during infection control rounding, things that we can't anticipate. And so a department that's trying to um, develop a culture of quality that's shared not just by the leader but by technicians will be more likely to identify these things because I guarantee you as a leader um, and working on competencies in your office, you may have one picture of what happens in your department because you had a hand in writing the policies and in writing the competencies and you sit down with technicians and quiz them about their understanding of those policies and competencies, but the technicians in your department, they really know what's going on 
on in Deacon Tam whenever Sally works in there. And uh, they have a much better idea of where those potential unknown compliance gaps and unknown quality issues uh, really lie. Um, and so super important to try to limit the unknown. Before we get into uh, talking about how to build this culture of quality, I, I want to pause for just a minute. Um, now that we've looked at our department with the lens of quality and identified the good enough, the bad, the ugly, and the unknown, and just give us an opportunity to think about the ideal state. Um, what what would that look like in your department? Um, Take a moment to think about those four categories of quality breakdown. What would it look like if your team had none of those issues affecting them? No one builds anything that they didn't first imagine. And it's impossible to achieve a culture of quality without sitting down to seriously think about what it looks like. What would it look like if everyone on your team decided that good enough was not good enough? that we're not going to live with non-compliant issues just because the OR asked us to, that we want to own our department's environment of care and we want to do everything we can to prevent those never events from happening, that we're going to educate ourselves and uh, be aware of the processes going on around us and limit those kind of unknown sneaky uh, bits of, uh, of quality issues in the department. So can your facility be compliant with every best practice? Do you want the facility, you want to be that facility that never immediately sterilizes a tray? What about the one that never has an outbreak from a single endoscope? What about being the, the first department to follow IFUs perfectly because we know how much of a challenge that is? What about having a team of experts, uh, the smallest team with the largest output? The way that we're going to get there is by having a shared vision that comes from the value of the team and the needs of the patient. The first step towards achieving that long-term vision, whatever pic mental picture you just came up with of your department, of what that looks like, of having quality in your department, there's going to be one common element across all of our mental pictures, and that's the idea of craftsmanship. Sterile processing is not just an entry level job in healthcare. It is a trade. It is a skill. And our technicians ought to see themselves not as entry level healthcare workers, but as craftsmen who are doing their work with skill to protect patients. It's a hard work environment to describe. Have you ever tried to do it, tell a family member what it is that you do, or I guess more particularly, maybe an inquiring uh, applicant who's never worked in sterile processing or doesn't know much about sterile processing, telling them what it's like? Because um, it's neither like mass production, uh, nor is it artistry. It's, it's somewhere in between. It, it contains elements of both. I remember being a sterile processing manager and talking with potential new hires and one of the illustrations I tried to use to get at this idea was that of being a jeweler maybe um, during that inspection process of having that attention to detail and that focus over a long period of time um, but that's only some of the aspect of it at other times our work did not feel at all like being a jeweler it felt more like working at you know UPS doing logistics and you know moving case carts through the hallways and taking phone calls and making sure things are on time and delivered in the right spot and sometimes it felt like working at a call center and um and it's kind of all over the map but um but the one thing that I always tried to emphasize for people is that we don't just plug into this job as people who are uh, filling a particular need. It's not a retail type job. Uh, we are learning a trade, a skill set, and we're trying to develop craftsmen, expert trained technicians who are both the happiest and the most knowledgeable employees in the hospital and uh, related to sterilization. And so that's the conversation. So what does it look like to build uh, this mindset of true craftsmanship in your department? Well, um, the first is uh, having a balance between accuracy and volume, that, that age-old quality versus quantity debate. Um, and craftsmen will see that these two things are complementary. They're not competing factors. 
I mean, is it really high quality if uh, if nine cases get delayed because you spent 10 minutes inspecting each mosquito clamp? Is that really quality? Like maybe the, the two sets that you did for the day were a high degree of quality, but but the patients who needed all the trays that you didn't get to, their surgeries got delayed because it wasn't there on time. Is that quality? I don't think your OR would say it is. Is it really quality if you assembled 100 trays over your shift, but 30% of them weren't usable or safe for a patient? Would your OR say that that's quality? I'm sure that they would not. They've got a balance and understanding of working smoothly with accuracy, trying to make sure that everything that passes through their hands is safe. And that kind of leads into the next commitment, the commitment not to let a defect pass their workstation. The reality is whenever a negative outcome happens related to a surgical instrument, it's not a singular person's fault. There are a lot of hands that that defect uh, passed through in getting to the patient. It starts maybe with the OR, not pre-treating that tray at the point of use. And then the technician, maybe they did not, or in decontam, that did not soak the tray uh, for the required amount of time during the manual cleaning process. Uh, maybe the department leader who did not ensure that the automated washer that the tray went through was on a preventative maintenance schedule um, and the washer didn't do its job appropriately. On the person who assembled the tray in the prep and pack area who failed to check that particular hemostat and catch that there was bio burden still in that instrument and they packaged it up as sterile putting their name on it saying this is ready for patient use and moving it on a craftsman mentality is someone who takes their job so seriously that they commit not to pass a defect along and think eh, the washer will be good enough to take that or eh, I trust Jim and Deacon Tam I'm sure he did a good enough job on this and we've got a lot of work to do I'm just gonna package it up and move it on that's not what a craftsman would do and then finally the discipline to continually improve um, Things like learning how you load a sterilizer is going to impact the steam's ability to kill microorganisms. That's what a technician ought to be learning rather than just, you know, I push this button whenever I load the sterilizer and it sterilizes the instruments, but really understanding the depth of how this machine works, why it works, why can I load it this way or not load it this way. And that's part of the value of, um, of certifications in sterile processing, having that base level of knowledge behind the why of what we do things and not just the what of what button do I push, but not just requiring certification at the state level like many states are doing for hospitals now, but also technicians who are hungry to get additional certifications to learn more about inspection points of instruments or um, perhaps getting a leadership um, certification, even if they have no aspirations to work in leadership. Sometimes having that certification and going through that thought process begins to help technicians think like leaders and um, and think about workflow and processes and things like that that are really, um, really valuable. Maybe a craftsman technician is someone who spends the time to learn more about the surgical schedule, learn some human anatomy and medical terminology so that they can better interpret a surgical schedule and know how to read it and know how to prioritize their work better because of it. Maybe somebody who is going to spend their time learning more about their instrument tracking systems, uh, things that they could do to help prioritize, maybe optimize some workflows in their department by implementing their tracking system better. Or, uh, you know, every department's got that one, you know, that one computer whiz. So maybe you're the guy who learns how to operate the, the dang sticker printer and learn, <laughs> learn how to load the ribbons in that zebra label printer. Um, a dedicated craftsman uh, technician is going to be someone who is investing in themselves and continuously learning and, um, and improving and not somebody who stays stagnant. And so for our industry to move into that ideal state, uh, quality has to be driven on multiple fronts. So the next station or the next section of this presentation emphasizes some questions that are essential to moving our team towards the gold standard of quality. So the first aspect of the department that I want to talk about 
related to quality is quality as a leader in your hiring, your promoting, and your retaining of employees. And this really is, I think, the rock bed of quality culture in a department. You can do a lot of things right uh, with your team to get them on board, to make them feel valued, recognized, to get the processes in place that they can follow and do well, to make sure everybody's got their training. But eventually, the reality is those technicians are going to move on. And if you don't have a steady pipeline built of quality technicians that are being hired and trained in the department, and if you don't have good processes in place to keep those high-performing employees engaged and um, and growing in your department, then ultimately you're going to experience a downgrade of your culture. You may have the same number of employees in your department, but your years of experience and the degree of the degree to which your technicians are bought into the value of this department is seriously going to downgrade. And so the first thing you've got to look at is, you know, what does our process look like for bringing people on, for promoting people and for keeping people here? So asking the question, who's in your recruiting pool is really important as a sterile processing leader. Um, what are you looking for in a new employee? Uh, are, are you out fishing for a bass, but you're using a crappie lure? You know, because what you fish for is what you're going to catch. Where I'm from in the region that I led in sterile processing is, I, I understand, is not a universal experience. Um, and so where I was at, there was not a sterile processing school in the region. Um, and it was very uncommon to find experienced sterile processing technicians on the job market looking to come into it. And as probably all of us recognize, there's not a lot of people out in the general public who even know what sterile processing is. So the number of candidates that I would get in just through the normal hospital recruiting pipeline was pretty pretty limited and pretty slow. It was kind of a trickle more than a more than deluge. And so what what I did and what I would encourage uh, you leaders to do is to get actively involved in the recruiting portion of your department. So meet with your recruiter and talk with them about where do these candidates come from and let them know what it is that you're looking for in a particular candidate, whether it's higher education or whether you're looking for customer service background or you're looking for um, people with a patient care background. Um, Having that, having that interview meeting with your recruiter might be able to help them better look for candidates so that maybe if they're a candidate applied to be a surge tech and it's not quite a good fit, they can funnel them into your pipeline and start getting you some more candidates that way. But, but even after doing that, I would encourage you to be even more actively engaged in your recruiting uh, program. I would say rather than sitting back and waiting for candidates to come to you through those programs, I would say get actively engaged in going out into the community and doing some of the recruiting, perhaps even yourself as you find time to do it. So are there any community colleges or, uh, or universities that are near your campus that you can get involved in and maybe do a job fair at? Are there any other uh, ministries that are helping place people for jobs? Close to where I was, there was a, a refugee ministry that would place uh, internationals uh, with with jobs in the city. And so we would say, L listen, our, our need for uh, for fluency in English is pretty high, but if you have some high-functioning uh, English speakers come through, we would definitely love to speak with them. And they became some of, some of our best employees. Um, there, there are a lot of different ideas of how you can do this, but getting involved with actively partnering with, uh, with your community and, and trying to get some applications come into your department can start to build some streams of applicants that will get you to the place of having a waiting list to be able to choose from whenever it comes time to, uh, to do hiring and interviewing rather than uh, depending upon the slow trickle that might be coming through your pipeline now and settling for somebody because you need a body rather than being able to be a bit more selective about the type of person that you're wanting to, uh, wanting to hire. And that being said, as you're going through that interview process and choosing who you're going to hire, I have found it is much easier to teach a good employee how to do sterile processing than it is to teach an experienced sterile processor how to be a good employee, if that makes sense. Um, and so the thing that I would encourage you to prioritize, yes, like experience is valuable, it is good, you want to find those candidates, but um, the thing that you should prioritize most in your interview process is who's going to fit within the culture that you're trying to build. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting 
um, lack of diversity in the department. When I say who fits with your culture, I'm talking not talking about who's going to make best friends, but is this type of uh, is this type of employee or is this person give you indication that they're a hard worker, somebody who values uh, human life and will make decisions based on what's right for the patient and not what's uh, personally important to them in the moment? Are they a collaborative worker who's going to support a team environment in the department? Um, those types of things. And when you find those types of employees and then you welcome them into a culture that is um, that is grounded on patient safety, where people collaborate together to be able to, uh, to work towards excellence, powerful things happen. Even more important than who you hire in the department is who you promote in the department. Um, because choosing who you promote into those leadership roles is underlining what values you're promoting for your department. And nothing is going to tear down a quality culture uh, faster than promoting someone who maybe has you know, the most seniority or experience in the role, but promoting someone into that role who's going to allow um, is going to allow issues and, and, and lack of accountability. Um, so maybe they try to be best friends with the department and they let everybody take long lunches or things like that. It, it begins to emphasize that in this department, we value uh, relaxation and we value personal um, personal preferences over having our trays done for the patients, and it'll begin to downgrade that. Um, and so be very careful in your promoting of, of thinking about from a cultural perspective, what values are we promoting into these leadership uh, positions? And um, that is also, by the way, why I'm a very big fan of growing your own leaders, because they're a known factor. You're able to help work with them on those things, and they can come from your culture and continue that uh, culture of excellence and quality forward. Whereas when you hire in from the outside, all you get is an interview and maybe a reference call, and that's all you know about them. And then you're asking them to come in and adjust to that culture. And it can work, but it's it's risky. And then finally, uh, retention. Um, what do you do um, to keep people in your department? And uh, a helpful question to ask is, would you work in your department if you could go anywhere else for the same pay? Now, when we do exit interviews with people, a common answer to get is uh, that famous three-letter word, pay. Um, but I would encourage you to break it down more than that, because sometimes it's deeper than just, uh, than just money. Maybe what they mean when they say pay is, I don't get paid enough to feel this frustrated all the time. Um, and what you need to work on isn't necessarily compensation, it's recognition. Um, maybe they're saying, I don't get paid enough for the work that I do that other people aren't doing. And there's an accountability issue in your department and they're leaving for pay because they wanna get paid that same amount somewhere else where there's not that accountability issue. Or maybe they're saying, and this is probably the most relevant for your high performers, I don't get paid enough for my talent or my expertise. They see themselves on a career trajectory of growth, and they see that this department is a dead end. And so what you can do is begin to give assignments or projects or opportunities for them to shine. Um, help them uh, document and summarize how they've personally helped improve the quality in this department and put it on their resume. Um, those achievements are going to be really important as they progress through their career. And it feels scary to do that, to be able to, to lift up and begin spotlighting people in the department because what's inevitably going to happen is those high performers are going to find leadership positions elsewhere around, uh, around your region. And you maybe have, you know, supervisors that you've placed in other hospitals all, all around the city around you. I don't know. But the value of doing that is it builds a culture of growth where people see this particular leader is invested in me personally and um, and things are moving and they'll stop seeing your department as a dead end job where you just earn a paycheck. And so whenever they look at their paycheck at the end of the day, they may be thinking, yeah, I could make this exact same money across the street, but there's so much more value here and I'm so much more excited about what we're doing here. That's where the secret sauce is in growing a team that's proud of what they do and proud to be a part of the team that they're a part of. You need to promote quality in your customer service. Um, and we'll pick up speed here a little bit because I know I'm running short on time. But um, 
your sterile processing department, if you want your team to feel proud of the work that they do and be about patient safety, they have to earn the trust of their customers. And we have to stop this war between the OR and sterile processing, where the OR is continually blaming and bashing sterile processing. And one of the ways that you can do that is by earning trust through some excellent performance, like, you know, fixing the quality issues that you see, but also through uh, having excellent customer service. We call our, you know, our ultimately our, our, our customer is the patient, but we call our, our ORs our internal patients, our, our surgeons, our, our clinics, um, and, and then also the customers of our, our, our frontline staff. And so um, little things that you can train and do in your department about like answering the phone clearly and respectfully, um, communicating communicating as much information as you can as a technician. Uh, so if, if the OR is calling and asking for a tray that you don't know where it is, one of the most uh, reassuring things that you can do throughout that process, rather than leaving them there waiting and wondering what's going on, is communicate, giving them a call back and communicating that you're still trying to locate uh, that tray. It can relieve a lot of anxiety and stress. Um, just little things like that where you train technicians to match the intensity of the OR as they're, you know, as they're requesting things and to communicate in a way that's uh, that's respectful and with just the highest degree of customer service I mentioned quality products that you you get out of this thing what you put into it um, and so evaluate what you're buying um, do you have a team that looks at instruments um, and evaluates them do you notice that certain instruments are rusting or cracking sooner um, looking at you know different product lines from different vendors and you know one vendor does, doesn't just universally have a top tier surgical instrument but the instruments you might be ordering might be an intermediate or a lower tier of surgical stainless and and so that could be an uh, an impact to it do you know what products you're sending out um are you confident in the trays that you're sending to the OR? Um, do you have any kind of quality management system in place? Do you have any kind of quality assurance checks that are done or routine spot checks that are done with these tray audits before they go to the OR? Do you have a plan in place to support products in the long term? Um, this is a great place to partner with vendors where they could come in and do in-services with your team, um, do preventative maintenance on your surgical instruments, and have an established process for getting the repairs and refurbishing those instruments. One of the important ways to have quality department is to have quality processes, we had said. And so um, one of the ways to ensure that your department's processes have good quality is to have a quality management system in place. And when I say quality management system, I mean a way of systematically evaluating your processes to ensure that they're meeting the quality standards that you have and your expectations. So um, that's going to look very different in different departments. Not everyone is going to uh, to fall into the same the same model based on how big your hospital is, based on what the needs are, uh, based on what your vision is for the future of like how good you want to make this thing, but what process do you have in place for collaboratively with your team evaluating a workflow to make sure it's still the best way to do things? Looking for opportunities to improve that. Uh, some of the best ideas that um, that have come in departments that I've led have been either from brand new or somewhat new technicians who are learning a process and discovered that this process doesn't make a whole lot of sense, or I learned it, um, but it was kind of hard to learn, or I learned it and it doesn't make a lot of sense, why don't we try doing something this particular way? And listening to that voice and uh, having that go to a team that evaluates, like evaluates the quality management of, of your processes and is able to, um, is able to trial some new processes, really valuable and important. Looking at your, uh, looking at your documents, quality in your documents. Um, first off, do you, do you know what documents you need to have in the department? Have you looked through your facility policies, through best practices, and through regulatory requirements to figure out what you're supposed to be keeping documentation of? Because that will be the first thing that an accreditation uh, surveyor will do in your department, is they will want to see your logbooks. Um, because, you know, it's unfortunate, but uh, in healthcare, 
if it's not documented, it didn't happen. And so are we documenting things um, that we're supposed to be documenting? And that may take some some research and some homework and some scavenger hunting from our leaders to figure out, are we documenting what we're supposed to be? But what I want to talk about is the team's commitment to quality in that documentation. So when you look at your documents, not only was it filled out the right way, but were there any other eyes that got put on that documentation? Think about it for a second. Our instruments that go through the sterile processing department, they get touched so many times. There are so many checkpoints along the way as instruments move through our process to arrive at being sterile. But when we have documentation, typically it's just one person documents it, puts it in a folder, and it's not looked at again, or at least not until three or four weeks later. Why don't we have at least some kind of quality check on our documentation as we do with our instruments? And when does that quality check need to happen? If it happens three to four weeks later, are we going to allow there to be an error in our documentation that, that lasts for three to four weeks? That could potentially have some negative impacts. I'm thinking about a particular department I was a part of where there was still a lot of paper documentation going on at the sterilizer station, and one of the things that was required was to initial off on the sterilizer printout strip at the beginning of this, uh, the sterilizer cycle, signifying that I've pushed the correct button and the machine has started the cycle I intended. And then at the end of the sterilizer uh, station, whoever unloaded the sterilizer would initial off reading the parameters of the sterilizer to ensure that what happened in the sterilizer cycle is what button was pushed and what we intended. And so um, one of the issues that happened, there was a cycle that was pressed accidentally that was an immediate use cycle and had no dry time on it, but we had terminal sterilization packages in there. They initialed the top of the uh, strip uh, and then came back as the same technician, initialed the bottom of the strip, put it in the folder, moved on with life. They didn't notice that there was any moisture on the outside of these rigid containers and then set them in sterile storage. It was later discovered through a quality assurance check that there was moisture in the bottom of those trays. We went back and looked at the documentation of it, you know, and here we are, you know, a week or two later and we had no quality check of someone else who came and verified that. And when we asked the technician about the initials on the strip, um, they said, well, I didn't really know why we put the initials on there, which is I just signed it because I thought there was a blank there. That's where I was supposed to sign it. And that just illustrates that um, having quality in our documentation can have a real impact on patient care. What if those trays had sat in sterile storage for another three, four weeks and all the moisture evapor evaporated from inside that tray? And this is, I'm, I'm not speaking about a particular containment system that, uh, that would allow for moisture to be in a tray. This would be outside the, um, the IFU for this packaging system. And then it gets to the OR. The OR would have no way of knowing the indicators would have passed. They would have used it on a patient and potentially could have had microbial growth on those instruments and that would not have been a good thing and so having better quality checking processes in place for our documentation and helping the technicians understand better what those initials meant could have potentially saved a patient from harm and so um, in your documentation are you able to demonstrate that the things that are supposed to be happening in your department are happening? And is there somebody who's looking at that documentation? And that doesn't need to necessarily be tied to a leader who's doing that, but a, a team of technicians who's passionate about our documentation being the best sterile processing documentation in the city, in the country. Um, we are going to get documentation done with quality. What about quality in our data? I don't know about you, but when I work in sterile processing, everywhere I worked, scan points were an issue. Um, <laughs> trying to convince technicians that it is important to scan those trays at every stage, even when decontam is way backed up and scanning them into the department or whenever they're in a hurry to deliver something out of sterile storage to scan it. Are we building into our technicians the belief that um, that the integrity of our data is valuable, that 
one of the outgrowths of our commitment to quality is we're going to have data that we can trust um, and the value in that and how that impacts patient care because ultimately it will if we don't scan our trays correctly then perhaps there's going to be a time when the OR has an emergency and we can't find the thing we need or if we don't scan our trays in decontam and we're missing those scan points when we do our productivity numbers it looks like we've done less work than we've actually done and that gets submitted for our department Department productivity and then we get FTEs taken away from our department and then we don't have enough people to get the work done and then surgeries get delayed like eventually it hits patient care at the end of that are we building a uh, a position of quality into how we're capturing our data and then for our leaders out there about data visibility are we committed to demo to sharing that data those KPIs what's being measured and looked at and shared with the hospital are we sharing that with the team are we welcoming them into this process so that when uh, when they look at the data, they can be a part of this big project of improvement and not just be left wondering what it is that the manager does at his desk and what is it that he's looking at and what are we even being measured on? And um, a better way to build a quality culture is one where everybody has that shared ownership of what we're trying to achieve and can work towards our goal. Last thing I want to say about the department before I address individuals is having quality, not just in our own department, but quality to the broader industry. So if you are listening to this and your department is absolutely killing it, there is a particular area of your department that you've found that you're doing very well and it serves patients very well in your hospital, why wouldn't we want to share that with others? Why not collaborate with the industry at large? Because whenever you get involved with this industry conversation, at what, through whatever means that you choose to do that, whether you join us at Beyond Clean on a podcast, or you get involved with your local conferences, or whether you go to the big national conference, or whatever it is that you choose to do to network, um, why not share some of those experiences? and spread some of that impact because we're not just in it for the patients who come in our doors. We're in this business and in this industry because we care about human flourishing in general and care about patients at large. So why not spread that impact through telling your story, whether it's through industry publications or, again, coming on a podcast and talking about uh, what process change you made and what um, – and what benefit it had for your department. So set aside some time to talk about uh, that in an article and submit it and try to get it published on your team's behalf. Um, not only is that going to help whoever reads it and tries to implement those things, but it will also do a lot for your department's culture as well as people see like, man, we are really a part of something great. Like we're doing something excellent here and people need to know about that. Also getting involved, particularly in those local settings and networking, can help with burnout. You'll start to see that the other leaders that you're talking to or the other technicians you're talking to are dealing with a lot of the same challenges you are, and it can give a lot of context to the challenges that you're dealing with. And then lastly, trying to share what your knowledge and experience is with the industry at large helps cultivate a legacy. Um, one of the things that I've heard one uh, one one person in our industry talk about that I thought was really powerful is why they got involved in podcasting and uh, and writing and trying to get uh, involved in education is because they didn't just want to be a, uh, a leader or a manager to the 14 people that were um, that were under their care. They wanted to be a manager to the industry. They wanted to share their knowledge with the industry. And so if your department is uh, succeeding in a particular way, try to spread that impact um, through getting involved in your local community or even at the international level through uh, through conversations with a conference, with a publication, or with a podcast. So to wrap things up here, because I know we are at, at time, I want to say a few words to our three kind of listeners, our, our frontline technicians, our educators, and our managers. If you're a frontline technician listening, I want to say you're Number one priority needs to be about patient safety. Everything that you do needs to bubble up out of that. If you have a brand new technician standing next to you and they ask you any of these three questions, your answer ought to be because you want the patient to be safe. Why do you set your workstation up the way that you do? Well, I set it up that way because I want the patient to be safe. I put the indicators here to the left of my locks because I work from left to right and I want to make sure that these indicators are in the trays before I put the locks on my rigid container. It's just one of the tricks that I do to make sure that my patients who receive these trays are going to be safe. 
they ask, well, why do you take the time to prepare fresh solutions between cases? Like, doesn't it take a lot of time to drain and refill your sink? Well, standards say best practice is, in order to help prevent cross-contamination, is that in between uses, we get fresh cleaning solution. And at this hospital, we define the use as a case. And so no matter how busy we are, I'm going to drain that solution and refill it, even if it doesn't look particularly uh, filled with debris, because I've washed a case in it and I want to limit cross-contamination and I want to keep the patients here safe. Why do you read every IFU or safety data sheet that you can get your hands on? Because I want the patients here to be safe. And uh, when this vendor tray comes in, something that I don't recognize, I want to make sure we process it correctly. You get the idea. Um, be that force in your department at the technician level that is about patient safety and start spreading that, um, that culture of quality. As a department educator, um, you have the fun task of walking a line between being the expert and uh, always being the learner, right? Uh, you walk the line between confidence and curiosity. Are you going to be an educator that is confident in your knowledge and skills so that you are the in-house expert on your processes and on what the reasons are for those processes? Sure, your department leader needs to know those things as well, but they've got other operational concerns that maybe will keep them from doing as deep of a dive as you do. Are you willing to be that educator that's going to stand your ground for patient safety because you know your stuff? At the same time, will you remain curious? Are you going to continue to look into cutting-edge technology? Are you going to be the first one to read about new standards, new TIRs or AMI guidelines that come out? If there's a publication about some new antibiotic-resistant bacteria on endoscopes, you need to be the first one in the department to be reading through that. Are you going to be a quality educator who's promoting a culture of excellence? And then lastly, as an SPD leader, and some closing words here, I want to encourage you to pursue three counterintuitive obligations as a leader. The first is lead like you're training your replacement. It's going to be true of you eventually that you're either going to move out or move up. And so actively while you're working, you should be trying to bring people into your work. You do not want to be the only one in the department who knows how to do certain things. You need to be elevating the work of the people around you, not only so that the department won't crumble when you take your vacation, but also so that you can build that culture of growth and excellence where people have a shared ownership of what it is that they're working on in the department instead of feeling like they are pawns on the chessboard of the leader's uh, vision. Secondly, don't make an outcome personally dependent upon you. It's great to have great individuals, but quality should occur even if you're not there. So if there's a process where let's say documents need to be checked, I would not make that process hinged upon you being personally the one to do it. That doesn't mean that you don't take a turn in doing so or that you don't make sure that it's happening, but I would not have the guy who's taking care of it be the leader. If COVID has taught us anything, uh, any of us can uh, for get sent out of work for two weeks at a time and you can't have the process fall apart on you. So empower the people who are working with you instead of making processes dependent upon you personally. And then thirdly, just get out of the way. Um, the purpose of your team is not to carry out your vision, but for you to guide the achievement of a shared vision. You are there to facilitate their success. So you can coach them all you want, but you can't run the bases for them. You can't stand behind them, hold their elbows, and move their forearms for them to do the work. And so outline expectations, encourage them, equip them, do everything that you can to help them, and then celebrate them as they succeed. And then as some don't succeed, sometimes you have to get out of the way of their failures as well. Um, and so make this leadership process about equipping, uplifting, and, and empowering your team and not carrying out your personal vision. And we're a few minutes over, so we're going to go ahead and wrap it there, but um, be about developing a, a shared uh, vision for quality in your department. Have all of the trays in your department meet that gold standard of quality that's good for your loved ones. And uh, I hope this presentation has been helpful in you evaluating your people, your processes, and your products to see what might be changed to best suit patient care. So with that, we'll wrap it. And I'd encourage you until next time, just keep fighting dirty. All right, Bobby, man, that was awesome. You crushed it. Thanks, brother. 
I think we could probably go for another hour listening to that presentation, but uh, just wanted to highlight how special that was. And hopefully those of you out there listening live appreciate it just as much as I do. I saw a, lo a number of great comments and uh, had some great, great questions come in too as well. So, and also a lot of uh, great reactions. We're gonna have to jump. Uh, Bobby did go a little bit long, so we gotta flip on over to our final session of the day, but I uh, just wanted to say thank you to all of you for joining us and looking forward to one more session of education and then we'll wrap it for the day. So thanks again, everybody, and great job, Bobby. Thanks, brother.